What is the academic achievement gap? Well, there's lots of gaps. Uh, there's gaps between males and females. There's uh, gaps between uh, student performance and uh, under-resourced communities and communities in which there are lots of resources. There's a gap internationally. The racial academic achievement gap is um, the difference that exists um, between academic achievement when it comes to white to Caucasian children and children of color. And the, uh, what, what has happened um, within our country is that white children are um, achieving at higher levels than students of color in many um, parts of the country. The main part I see it is that African American students specifically, but other minorities as well, especially Latino and African Americans, that they don't perform as well as their white counterparts when it comes to things like standardized test scores, GPA even, and even college persistence. Beyond that, I think poverty is a major part of it, is that, for example, the African American community, there's, there's, there's higher rates of poverty than there are maybe in some other racial groups. You've got a lot of disadvantaged um, things happening in certain neighborhoods. And I think if you look even around our own school, the lack of businesses um, that, that affect our kids and where they work and what they see as they're walking to school every single day. Chicago is such a segregated city, right? Most big cities are, right? They have large populations of black and brown people who are geographically isolated. There's no, there's no reason why kids who live out in the suburbs, for example, say up in like Highland Park or New Trier up there, why should they have more money per, per student for, edu for their education than, than kids who go in this, or in this community. And what needs to happen is the money has to be allocated properly and it needs to be used for the right purposes. Right now with the, the way that many schools are funded, um, public school, public education is based on property taxes. And so, you know, depending on the wealth and the, uh, the wealth that exists in a community, um, certain schools are going to get more resources because of the property values that exist in those communities. But then there's also a need for family engagement. Um, parents need to understand that there are things that they can do that'll build students' brain power long before they step into a classroom. I've seen our parent participation go down. So, so many parents, even though they're well-intentioned, they want the best for their children. That's why they bring them, that's why they send them here. They may not always understand how to actually push their students in the, or, or their children in the right way. I think parents want to be engaged, but I think schools haven't figured out what is the important things that parents want to get engaged in. I think we have to uh, schedule and engage parents in more creative ways. There's just also just needs to be a lot more support for um, families and communities. That early childhood development piece has an impact on how they will do in grammar school before they come to high school. So we have to figure out the way to do grammar schools and high schools in a way that everyone gets the preparation that kids from the most wealthy schools get. So like how do we uh, provide more resources and support for families from birth up until they get to high school so that um, they can address some of those um, needs that students may have. So we have to really fix that in the country right now because the educational opportunities and access to great schools is really divided ar uh, along socioeconomic lines and that can't be. And beyond that, I think it's also a linguistic challenge, meaning that I think a lot of the, you know, I mean, the problem is that, that, that if you're assessing kids' learning, assessing kids' skills, and you're just using this one measure, like a standardized test, that assumes that you understand standard English and, and speak in it constantly, our students are, are at a disadvantage. When you're talking about science and math, it's about a lot more than just your ability to speak standard English. Right, it's about your ability to process, to, to think critically, to make decisions. So that's one part of it that really plays a role in the writing portions of tests and, and maybe even in the reading uh, comprehension portions. But in the other areas, it doesn't play as large a role. Students are not always translating the skills to different environments. And they may have the skill um, when they're reading about something that they're interested in. But then when they go to take this test and have this reading passage and it's about this concept that they have never heard of or they're really unfamiliar with some of the language that's being used, a lot of our students will shut down. I believe all students coming out of a school, especially a college prep school, should know how to speak standard English very well. If they're going to be successful in a country that's, 
that um, value standard English, then they need to make sure that they have that ability when they need it so that it's an even playing field for them. For, for example, for our students in North Lawndale, I told you this before, I think that so many of our students, they speak a dialect of English, right? We talk, whether you call it African American vernacular English or you know, standard black English, whatever you want to call it, our students don't speak standard English. Unfortunately, there's a huge disconnect between what happens in the classroom and what shows up on these tests. They are blaming teachers. They put them on the cover of Time Magazine with a big apple saying it's the teacher's fault. Again, it goes back to the resources that are being provided to our teachers. I think it depends on the teacher, first of all. You can't, you can't learn from someone who you don't trust, you don't respect. And so once, once you start with that relationship, then you can really push, okay, now that I know you as well as I know you, now I can really push you and, and expect more out of you. So I think some of it is just being very clear on what your expectations are um, at the beginning of a semester, of a course, or with any assignment, or when any assessment that you have, and kind of looking, um, being clear about what it is that you expect and what you want students to know coming out of it. It doesn't do us any good to say, this is where I need you to perform, this is where you need to be, but you're down here, and I have no way to get you there. So I need to set the expectation really high and while you are here, every step of the way, providing the educational experiences you need at your level each time to get to this point. And what, how much can our teachers do? They're not superheroes. They're here in our school on time. They're here ready to teach our kids. But when you've got low attendance rates in the morning um, and you've got a lack of resources in the community, it is hard. So the best thing is for educators to also be lifelong learners themselves and to always make improvements to their practice and to always think, reflect, and assess on how effective their practice has been on actual students. And don't just use the way they feel about the content to drive whether or not they teach it well. I think principals are the big coach. They should be someone that is really able to identify great instruction. So leadership at a school plays a key role in closing the gap. So I think a great academic leader that defines what success looks like. They're a terrific coach for teachers who want to get better. Leaders also need to improve their practice by staying engaged in best practices around leadership, best practices in learning. They got to make sure that teacher instruction is covering all aspects of the beautiful, marvelous miracle called the teenager. Because if they don't know what should be going on in the classroom, how can they help their teachers know what should be going on in the classroom? In a society, that's based on competition, there will always be a gap. Because there's always going to be a gap between the wealthy in this country and the people who aren't wealthy. Like I think some of it is like because of the achievement gap, um, a lot of students are often limited in their choices of schools, of colleges, of careers, and really um, being able to kind of achieve their own dreams. Even if everyone was about the same level of achievement and intelligence, the ones who were at the top of that list would still be at the top of that list because we rank people and we sort people. Our society is capitalistic. And I don't understand, and I don't see a path for how we could escape inequality. Because we have to keep in mind when people refer to an achievement gap, they're talking about a very narrow aspect of intelligence. I'm not sure that in a country like ours that you could ever not have an achievement gap because it's about inequality. But the reality is that as long as you have inequality, as long as you have racial segregation, as long as you have poverty, right, in, the, in places like Chicago or Philly, where I'm from, LA, whatever, pick a city, you will, the achievement gap will persist.